Hello and welcome to another edition of Crocker Art Museum's Thursday Nights In. We are so happy and thankful to be able to continue bringing you programs that highlight the amazing artists working in our community. My name is Brianna Charles and I'm the Public Programs Coordinator at the museum. Tonight we are focusing on one dearly missed art form, dance. I have the honor of being joined by Isela Perez, Jalen Tyree, Claire Emery from SAC Dance Lab, and Melissa Cervantes and Alexandria Griffith of the Lorelei Bain Project. Thank you all so much for joining me tonight. I hope you're all doing well and hanging in there. Yes, totally. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Brianna. Thank you. So all of you are involved with two groups that uh, we over at the Crocker work with super regularly on programs like Hatch and Art Mix and different family festivals and things like that throughout the years. So this is really an exciting opportunity for us to get to know the creative folks behind all those awesome performances that we've watched uh, throughout the years. Uh, so I want to jump right in uh, and see, could you tell us a little bit about yourselves and how you got into dancing and working with these great companies? Alexandria, do you want to get us started? Sure. Thank you so much, Brianna. I'm Alexandria Griffith. I began dancing hula when I was in high school. My aunt has a halal in Stockton, California. And I didn't find my passion for modern dance until I was in college studying psychology. I signed up for a class titled Modern Dance. And I always think it's pretty funny to tell this because I thought modern dance was hip hop dance. And I thought, oh wow, I'm gonna take hip hop dance. <laughs> uh, that's not what I found that day. And since then, I have just never stopped dancing modern dance. That was in 2012. Here I am today, still doing it. Thanks to Lorelai, Flick, Lisa Ross, everyone at, all my mentors at Sac State. They're pretty awesome, so. Great, right, thanks, Alex. Uh, let's just move right down the line and uh, Melissa, do you want to answer next? Yeah, so I also started dancing when I was um, in my teens, maybe even before that, maybe out of the womb, who knows. Uh, but with Lorelei specifically, uh, I was introduced into the dance to the to modern contemporary art form when I attended Sac State long, long time ago, <laughs> and um, have been with her since through different companies, um, different projects. And, and now I teach with her at Sac State. Awesome. And both Melissa, you and Alexandria are principal dancers for the Lorelei Bain Project. What, what does that mean and what is that like? Melissa. <laughs> I could take it. <laughs> yeah, uh, so principal dancer. <laughs> That title supposedly means that you're like one of the main dancers for the company. Um, and I think with Lorelai, it's it's how long you've been with her and done projects with her, how long you've built relationship work with her. Um, I would say she would call a principal dancer. Um, and so that entails showing up, showing up, uh, collaborating, working, um, listening to each other definitely in the space. She. She uses a lot of improv, and um, I have taken that also into my artistry, and I've noticed that her process definitely influences my own process. Awesome. What about you, Isela? How did you get into all of this awesome work? Oh, I, Isela, I think you need to unmute yourself. That would be really helpful if I did. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I've been thinking about this um, for a couple of days just because I have a hard time remembering really when it all started. Um, but I think when I was a kid, I used to be obsessed with music videos, which I'm now understanding was because I love the choreography and the movement and the visual to it. Um, 
And I was that kid where I would like round all my friends and be like, hey, you guys, we're going to like learn a, a dance today. You're going to cover my house. So that that um, drive to create movement has kind of always been there. Um, formally, I've been dancing and training for about 22 years. I won't tell you how old I am. But um, in that time, I've kind of jumped around. I, I was also um, very happy to say that I also went to Sac State and minored in dance in the same program um, as the other two ladies who just spoke. Um, awesome program. And, but I kind of was more interested in, in a commercial route where, you know, NBA dance, NFL, um, stuff that you would see in the music videos and behind artists, um, sometimes even forefront of the artist, right, depending. So um, that's kind of how it all started and the passion to really open SAC Dance Lab, which is a studio that caters to dancers that want to be professionals in the commercial industry. I felt like it was so needed in Sacramento. Um, and so I've been happy to be doing this for three years now um, and we hope to continue and keep growing. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what about you, Claire? Um, so I, I was in a hip hop, um, high school dance team. I went to Folsom Lake College. Well, Folsom High School. But um, like Alexandria, I really didn't discover my passion for dance until I went to Folsom Lake College. Um, and just for fun, you guys, I took a ballet class. Like I'd always, but I like just wanted to wear a tutu. Like I just wanted to like make fun of myself. I ended up loving it. Um, I fell in love with my professor and then I took, you know, jazz, hip hop. And then from there I was like, this is what I'm going to do. I graduated with an associates in dance studies. And after that, I just went straight to work. I worked at several dance studios at once, making that my full-time job. Um, and then I met Isela and I started training with her and she was like, dude, like go audition for the, you know, the King. So um, this past season, I was um, part of the first the first group of 916 crew dancers for the Sacramento Kings. And it was an amazing experience. Glad I did it. Wow, that's awesome. I didn't know you did. Were you a part of that also? All right, Jalen, what about you? Hello, everyone. So um, I started dancing in my church, actually, when I was about uh, six years old. Um, I went to a studio class when I was around the age of three, but I wasn't I wasn't feeling it. My mom was kind of forcing me at that point. But I started dancing when I was around six in my church. And that's where all of my passion and um, contemporary and uh, like African and other styles came from. And then I started training in studios around Sacramento when I was around 14. I joined a few crews, adult crews, and started to train myself. And finally, around 17, I went to L.A. to go uh, get an agency. Um, and since then, I've been dancing like behind artists like Daddy Yankee and uh, Nikki Jam and just a lot of, um, of the Latin world uh, because I danced the choreographer in the Bay Area for a moment that uh, brought us to that to that um, artist as well. Um, but I met Isela three years ago and I started teaching in Sacramento. That was when I wanted to become a teacher and inspire the dancers around me to also want to enter the same industry that I was in, in as well. So um, I started teaching with Isela about three years ago and it's been nothing but growth and love and dedication in our community in Sacramento. And it just makes me happy to be a part of um, a studio that embraces that and they embrace also us being ourselves and wanting to travel and do our thing because as dancers, you know, we're very busy bodies. So yeah, that's how I got started. And that's how long I've been teaching at Side Dance Lab for about three years. <laughs> nice. I love hearing about how people get into all these creative uh, pockets of our community. And so I think something else a lot of people probably wonder about is where you get your inspiration from what ins what kind of things like inspire your dance practice um alexandria could you speak to that at all yes i can i feel like from my own approach to when i'm creating dance it's usually something that i'm carrying on my heart something that inspires me from my mentors or my peers even. Uh, I've danced with Melissa uh, with and for her. Uh, she and Lorelai have, their artistry has really influenced me and they're inspiring. I've also had a chance to, to dance with 
Linda Bear in Davis, uh, another powerful woman. I am just so happy to have all these women that I just, I learned so much from all of them and what's happening in the world, what's happening in my family, what's happening in our little circles and communities, all of these things inform dance, how I created and it's always pretty close to my heart and usually a very vulnerable place for me. So thank you for asking. Um, I think for me, do you have anything to add? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jalen. Hey, I, I'm so sorry. I, I just <laughs> jumped in there. <laughs> sorry, Melissa. Uh, I think for me, when it comes to creating, I, ask, I agree with Alex a lot when it comes to personal experiences and how I'm feeling at the moment. Like sometimes if I'm feeling like I'm just in an angry mood, I will play a song and create, you know, and it's, it's really an outlet for us as creators and dancers. And just to be able to teach other students and teach people is an awesome part of it. But I feel like majority of us create for, for our well-being, you know, for us to feel good, for us to be able to express how we feel with others through dance. So I believe like it's always something that has to do with our hearts and something that we're just super connected to as choreographers. And that's just, yeah, we can't help it, <laughs> but that's it. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, there you go, Melissa. Now yeah, I would have to ditto repeat um, what Alexandria and Jalen um, shared. Um, definitely life experiences for sure inform the work and but also sometimes it's also resisting what's happening in your life that can come out as well so it's playing balancing what you need in the form um with maybe sometimes what you desire or what what's on your shoulder <laughs> um so it varies i think with every project every um, work it's different it's always an interesting journey mm -hmm. Yeah, and thinking about that journey, uh, it's everyone's going to have something a little bit different. It's, that's always fun to see that come out in all your different performances. Yeah, I think to add to that. Isella, did you want to add on to that? Yeah, um, to add, it's, it's so interesting because I think big differences between the styles of dance have to be where the movement comes from. Um, and... I think one of the biggest challenges that I'm sure we've all faced is when you're working for something um, that is external, there's already a vision and you're given that vision and, or the constraints of that. And, and you have to find a way sometimes to fit, you know, a square peg in a, in a circle in a hole. Right. And then you're just like, I don't know how I'm going to come up with this. Um, and sometimes that challenge of working, whether it's with a client or an artist or um, your teacher, or your professor, who's telling you, challenging you what, you know, where you need to stretch. And sometimes you can't find that thing um, to inspire it. And that rolls over sometimes for me and just makes me force something out. And sometimes that like beginning of that work ends up being one of the greatest things that I feel I can create because I was pushed at a challenge point. It wasn't okay, I'm sad, I'm going to turn a sad song and go dance sad. You know, it's it's really not that direct. And so I think that that's one of the big challenges internally that choreographers face and dancers where sometimes you don't have somewhere to pull from. You know, it's kind of like writer's block, um, but then somehow it, it happens. So there's some magic, I think. I'm on mute, Brianna. Thank you. Along that line of thinking about how choreography comes to be, um, I think, uh, you know, a lot, what a lot of I see is the end product of uh, probably weeks of practicing and training. Uh, but of course, there's a lot that happens uh, that we don't see. So what goes into the process of creating choreography for your company's performances? What kind of things do you have to take into consideration when creating choreography for a group like that? Uh, Melissa, do you want to kick us off with that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for 
And I think this goes to, goes to say the same with uh, with Alexandria and Lorelai. With my own process, it's it's collaborative. Um, usually, it entails improvisation, like I've mentioned before. So looking at what someone else has to offer and then kind of putting your own stamp on it or just strictly using what they can bring and then seeing how it fits in the bigger picture as a choreographer. Um, and then with my own process, there is a lot of conversation about um, if a concept comes up or what is happening in the movement, the raw movement itself. Uh, for the work uh, that Lorelai was going to showcase for, um, Alex, you can remind me <laughs> what the work was because I was only part of the process actually. Um, it, it was very quick, like her process is very quick and um, she'll, she'll mention like a word or share a poem and then she says, for instance, make up five moves to that. And then she'll look at it and um, put it together. And then music kind of comes later, sometimes before. Um, so it's like putting puzzle pieces together. Claire, do you feel like you have a similar experience or do you take a different approach? Um, I'm more of a commercial dancer, so my approach is quite different. I um, I can't be like, I'm feeling sassy, like, you know what I'm saying? So um, a lot of it is we listen to kind of like a top 40 playlist, like what's new, what's popular, you know? So um, a lot of the times, um, like for example, with Estella's, company sack dance company we do a lot of outside performances like in midtown super fun um and it's all ages you know we've got kids and you know old people and so we want to pick music um that's high energy and that's recognizable um with lyrics that they can sing to and we kind of put a theme to it sometimes it's a beyonce theme a bruno's mars theme you know something really fun um and with those type of popular songs i mean it the moves just are kind of pulled out of you. You know, you got to put a hair whip if it's a Beyonce. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, just like little things. <laughs> just laughing, like little things um, like that. So thank God, like we have good music nowadays where um, the artists can just kind of pull some some moves out of you. Um, so yeah, I think for us, the music is first and then the moves have to follow that. Um, but yeah, sometimes like with Estella, we'll dance on like a stage that's like this big and there's like <laughs> 10 of us, you know, and we get there and we're like, oh, we'll be right back, you know, and we just like, <laughs> we're dancers and we're so malleable. We're so used to like thinking of your, on your feet. So it's like, okay, you're going to take the solo. Da -da -da -da. This is going to be a trio, you know? So um, yeah, that's the dance life. It's, and that's part of creation. So if anyone's watching this, <laughs> if you're a future client of ours, send us our, our like <laughs> our measurements before. We appreciate <laughs> that. But it's it's so fun. It's all good. We love it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, Isela or Jalen, do you have uh, anything to add as well? Yeah, I, I mean, if Jalen if Jalen wants to start, only because they've both done choreography for the company, and I'm sure they've had a similar experience, but I'm sure their processes are a little different. Yeah, um, for me, I've worked with the Sellers company a few times now, and one, it's super fun, but with every group, you have to attend to their needs and what they bring to the table. So for me, um, when it came to working with Sack Dance Lab in particular, we had pretty much of a structure of what we're gonna, what they were gonna do for the set, and everything was pretty much, you know, I just have to fill in my choreography, my filling, make sure everybody gets it, and formate it from there, you know. Um, but with certain other groups, there's not always a platform or, or something to set off of. You really have to go in and um, as a choreographer, sometimes build the whole vision and um, make sure that it's something that is still what they see, you know, without changing what they see, you still have to bring in you, them and some nice choreography. Um, for me, when it comes to working with a lot of groups, I like to to see where their head is at, see what what, what are you looking for truly in your choreography? What are you looking for? Are you looking for performance value? Are you looking for a story? Are you looking for technique in hip hop? Like, um, and that's just the basic questions. But, um, and once you figure that out, you know, you go through song choices, you go through uh, how many people are there? What formations do I want to work with? So with every group, there's a basis of like five or six things that you, you question and make sure you understand what you're about to embark on, you know, what you're about to start with these groups. And then once you figure it out, it's pretty much, 
not easy, but as a creator, we've we've done it a lot to where we can be like, okay, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna figure it out overnight, you know, like in a dream or something. And it can be that simple, or it can take a month, and you have to really be specific and and go through the actions a lot of times. So it's never really the same, like they were saying. It's it's it can be very different, especially in the hip hop world and commercial world. You don't know what what they're about to throw at you. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much my process. I just ask a few questions and then I go from there. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, and, and I've had the pleasure of watching both of them work. And um, the cool thing I think about, like Jalen was saying, commercial dance offers sort of a platform of, you have a standard of what's expected. You know, when you're a choreographer and you go into a, a company um, that has a commercial style, you know, you have perfect eight counts, you have formations, you have your music cut, everything is cut, ready to go. Um, where, you know, I think with concert dance, it could be different. You know, it's built onto the dancer, which it creates a totally different um, feeling. And so I think they both work for different reasons, obviously. Um, my process with the company is, um, I would say you can't rush creativity. And when I have tried to, I'm sure this has happened to all of us, I hope, you look at the end product and you're just like, no, that's not working. Um, and, and it's hard because you are your own worst critic, right? We know that as, as um, artists, but you know your peers probably think the same. And so it's kind of hard because you're eating away at yourself at like, okay, is this good enough? Is this really as, as you know, what I envisioned? Um, and sometimes you nail it and sometimes you don't. And I think that that process, that thought process is what gets in the way sometimes of my personal process. So what I try to do is just have an end goal. You know, what do I want the audience to feel? Usually with Sack Dance Company, you want them to be smiling and jumping up and down and just totally energized. Um, and so with that end goal, you find the music that matches, you find the dancers that can bring that energy. Um, and so uh, it's a constant hustle though, I think. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. That, that's so interesting to hear how many different perspectives or approaches there are depending on your end product. And that makes sense. A lot of times you like to relate it like our own experiences back to, uh, I can think with, like with visual art, I think of, I've experienced a lot of the same thing. So that's interesting. Um, we have a, a question from uh, Diego on YouTube. And he asked, how have these kinds of isolation informed or transformed your artistic work? Yeah, how have you guys been uh, staying busy and keeping moving during this time? Um, Isela, I know you mentioned that you're teaching some classes outdoors now. Yeah, um, we've adjusted as a studio for sure. Um, and we've started doing um, the first week that we were um, closed, we started doing some YouTube classes, Instagram, doing the virtual thing, um, which I think, frankly, all of us are really ready to just dance together. <laughs> so now we started doing some outdoor classes this week. Um, when we're dancing in our parking lot. So again, we like the pop-up outdoor thing. So why not start early this year? Um, actually, classes are going on right now, like 100 feet from me, which is great. Um, and so we, we have adapted. Um, in terms of art, I think, you know, for us, it the at least for me personally, the game doesn't really change in terms of having just to stay current on what is the new song that just came out, you know, um, that was dropped a few days ago. Okay, let me learn that song. That's what people are going to want to dance to and so on. So there's kind of a driving force, right, um, for us in our process. But there's some cool songs that have come out that have totally talked about the quarantine and like, you know, like that. What's that one song that just dropped? Like he's bored at home, right? I know you guys know what song I'm talking about, but I was like, no way. They're already dropping music on, you know, this. So yeah, it's totally impacted how we create. And it's also kind of comical, but yeah. That's funny. Um, Alexandria, what about you? How are you adapting or moving forward through this? Thank you for asking. I'm, I can't wait to share with you. So it's very interesting because I've been, uh, pairing up with my husband and creating dance videos. Uh, also trying to give yoga classes, movement time via Zoom. So we're doing things that we haven't actually ever done before, going out to the park and filming dance and everyone's walking by because I know they want to do it and we look kind of <laughs> weird. <laughs> so uh, what I am finding though is how much I really cherish dance in a room 
with people who love doing the same exact thing that I love to do. And there's something about dancing and sweating two feet away from someone. And I mean, taking that really close, you can smell everything in the room. These visceral things, wow, we take those things for granted. And I mean, it's it's been really nice to think of dance differently. How can we share this still? How is coronavirus going to inspire us to create more dance about just sitting in a, in a little place? So uh, really thinking about how dance can be confined, but also there's so many more epiphanies that have come to me. So uh, yeah, thank you for asking. Of course. What about you, Melissa? Yeah. Um, so primarily concert dance is what has been in my rep in the last 10 years. So in this time of COVID, it's really made me think about dance film in a way. Um, uh, I just finished grad school last year and a, uh, I'm thinking of taking the 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 film that I have from my work and kind of compiling it into dance film because that's choreography in its own way editing film for sure so um, and you can stay six feet away from people when you want to produce something new or if I wanted to produce something new so I've been thinking about that a lot um, and just revisiting the work I did in school um, wondering when that's gonna come back to my plate. Um, and then jiggling at home with my babies. Yeah, so. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's great. So kind of thinking about things that we, we miss or maybe uh, didn't appreciate quite enough. Um, <laughs> let's think back a little. What have been some of your guys' favorite performances that you've been able to do? Um, Jalen, could you speak to that? Yeah, I, it's really hard to pick one or two, honestly, because I feel like every performance is just like a different feeling. But re more recently, um, I got to travel to uh, Russia, actually, and perform at a show there. And not only was it cool to like travel and do what I love, because that's just, you know, it's what we all want to do is just travel the world and just be happy and dance. Um, but it was just really cool to be around people that you have nothing in common with, but to be able to dance and have that love and joy in the same room. Um, and th those kind of feelings, when I go out of the country and I get to perform, it's it's unforgettable because like I said, it's the one thing we have in common. And you see how powerful like dance and 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 just the culture and just the love is um, everywhere. And I don't think we realize it, like, sorry for talking about, but we don't realize it when we're in our home, you know, um, how powerful our movement and our feeling is through a screen. And um, it's most memorable to me because I will never forget it. You know, it's just like being able to high five someone just because they love your dancing or just because you love their dancing. And that's such a powerful thing in, in this world, especially when people are just, you know, just so busy saying everything bad. But when you can feel that energy and that love from people who understand nothing else but your dancing, it was great. So that's my one moment I can share. <laughs> yeah. Claire, what about you? It seems like um, working with uh, the Kings dancers you've probably uh, been on some pretty cool stages um well this was the first year with 916 crew and we were kind of like the guinea pig year so the only stage we really got to see was number one was the nba court which is the best stage ever um but we also got to dance um during our outreaches we would do like public outreaches at elementary schools and just you know a few of us would um be sent there and dance for the kids which was so fun and they are better than wooing that than i am it's, <laughs> it's amazing um but i mean I, I miss, and I'm sure we can all attest to this, but I miss just an audience. You know, like we're a dancer, right? We love that spotlight. I miss um, an audience. I miss like just seeing the crowd happy and, and hyped up after a performance. Um, yeah, so that, 
That's one thing. Yeah. Obviously like, yes, I miss dancing, but I also miss like who I'm dancing to and who I'm dancing for, because, you know, it takes weeks, sometimes months to perfect a routine. And then it's that like one minute you get and you're like, please love it. You know? And then when they like clap, it's like, okay, thank God. So yeah. I miss that. I miss the fans a lot. I can't wait to be back. <laughs> and Sally, you know, <laughs> she was also a King's dancer. Yeah, I do. I, I totally get it. I think, you know, all, all of us being in Sacramento, like we have a, a special place for, I think, the King's dancers, whether you were part of them or not, or you do that type of dance or you're an audience member, because they've been around so long. And now that they're um, transitioning, it's cool to see how they're adapting. Um, but yeah, I think personally, I, you know, what, some of my favorite performances, I danced with the Kings for five seasons. Um, and my last season was with the new arena. There's nothing like the lights coming down in the house. And you're, you know, whether you're on the side of the stage and you're behind a wing or you're ready to run onto the court, it's the same feeling of showtime. And that is like why we do what we do. And it's so funny because I don't know if anybody realizes, but a lot of the NBA or professional dancers who are in the commercial world, most of the time we're on the stage for minutes. I mean, it's for the NBA, it's a minute, 10 seconds. Otherwise you get fined, right? Um, and so you're cramming all of this hours and practice and perfection into a minute and, and 10 seconds. Um, and you have one chance and you have a coach, hopefully that's looking at every single person has the eagle eye. We all know the eagle eye. You're like, Oh, I'm so in trouble for my pinky being in the wrong spot. Um, but that pressure those moments of like the crowd agreeing that you were able to do it and execute all that hard work, just totally worth it. It's like getting off a roller coaster, like when you're done performing any style, right? You're just like, woo. So that's what I totally miss. Um, I think for the company, we've, we've had the pleasure of, of um, dancing at, at our mix a few times and the crowd there is awesome. So I look forward to doing that again. Yes, I look forward to it too. <laughs> Um, Alexandria, Melissa, do you have anything to add on your uh, favorite performances? The first thing that came up in my head was actually the courtyard in at the Crocker. Because it's outside, it's, um, you don't know who your audience is, <laughs> not all the time. Um, I do miss the courtyard dancing on the cement. <laughs> Yeah, I was actually, when I was writing my questions for this, I was thinking back um, to the piece that I think your group did for Art Mix Makeshift, and it was very colorful and related so well to uh, the exhibition you had up at the time. Mm -hmm. I think that it was, was really uh, a fun one. A fame? Was it Fame? And then the other one that Laura Lai presented was with uh, the artist, I'm forgetting. But it's very colorful, like you said. For um, Richard Jackson. Yeah, for Richard Jackson. So yeah. I enjoy, she enjoys the challenge too. And as a performer for her, I enjoy um, just kind of getting a twist because, you know, getting the layer of what y'all want in the process or the work on top of what we have to input into uh, the work itself and what we have to present. And then uh, not really at the Crocker, it's, you kind of know you have your returning your returning audience, but um, I think like with art mix and the different events like Hatch, it, it varies. So it's nice to play because, and I think everyone in this virtual room could agree, uh, whoever's in the room, you feed off of them as a performer. So um, I think that's what we're talking about. We miss that. We miss that connection with our that dance that dancing with our audience for sure. So we have another question, um, and we've talked, we touched on this a little bit. Um, Danielle asks, has the quarantine inspired your future works to integrate more video or virtual dance into your work? Um, Melissa, I know you said you're looking back on those uh, older school recordings and thinking how you might use those. Um, yeah, absolutely. That's been in my head. But right now, as we're speaking here, I'm like, why don't we reach out to SAG Dance Lab? Let's do something together. That would be fun virtually. Because <laughs> there's such a contrast. And I think that would be really interesting. So 
the ideas come and you're like, why not? Why? Why not? <laughs> we're, we're living in our houses. Like <laughs> we can do things six feet apart. So it's, uh, it has changed uh, my outlook on how I produce work and how you can outreach a bigger audience for sure in that way. But I do miss the live performance. And there's part of me that resists the virtual world because it's hard to get the feeling unless the editing is really good and the music, everything fits together and you only see it once, right? It's like one com compacted package in film or something that you see on TV versus something live that you can experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jalen? Um, yeah, I think for me, it's showed me how much potential I have to create um, more videos with for my own content. and how fast I can do it. And I think it's made me realize like when I'm forced to do so, I can create so much more. Um, and I think beforehand I didn't, like um, Melissa was saying, I didn't really want to create a lot of video content. It wasn't it wasn't really feeding me and what I needed. I love the class aspect and being around people more, but being forced to um, do a lot of things on my own and and teach virtually, it's, it's taught me I'm so much more capable of um, other outlets that involve uh, virtual and video um, purposes, you know, and, and using those as my outlets. So I think I'm I'm going to be a lot better at um, being able to one, teach virtually, learn virtually, and make more content um, quicker and easier. So I think that's something I definitely learned from being forced to be in my home. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Isela, can you speak to anything um, as to how SAF Dance Lab uh, is kind of looking forward in the future in that way? Yeah. Um you know, it's kind of ironic because I think in the last, uh, since we've been closed, it's been 10 weeks now. Oh, it's okay, we'll make it through. <laughs> um, it, it's actually been a little bit of an opposite struggle for us because the content that we rely on as a studio to share our work um, is no longer being produced, right? So um, what we would love to do is get, hey, Jalen's video, it was fire tonight, we're gonna post it right away everyone can kind of feel like, oh man, I got to be at the next class. That helps us grow our community, right? So it served as such a huge reason as to why um, people know about us and know that they can come and dance with us. But um, during this time, I mean, I'm bugging people for like, hey, do you have that video from July that I don't, <laughs> I don't know if I ever posted, but like I need content. And it's been interesting because um, other like awesome groups, you know, Crocker, SAC 365, um, Visit SAC have all been kind of reaching out to, to band together to pull more content together. So it's been really cool to pull from things that, you know, I, of course I have a ton of videos. So to share that, um, but also reach out to dancers to see what they've recorded and what they have. Um, and so a lot of it is finding some cool archive video, throwback videos. Um, and it's cool because I think now, you know, if you look at your profile, as a dancer, as an artist, it's changed, right? Like what we're, we're providing our product is changing. Um, and so I think it's cool that we can adapt, but I'm really excited to get some live videos in the new studio. <laughs> totally. <laughs> and I, as um, a plug for our own, we worked with you guys to, um, with both the groups, uh, Saf Dance Lab, we uh, are going to, you can actually watch it now. Our, uh, we've posted a one of your demos. Um, I believe it's intermediate jazz. So I see uh, Stacy's wondering, are we going to get a ga dance lesson to burn off the ice cream? Uh, if you follow the link that's right on the screen there, you can watch that demo um, and get moving in your own living room. Um, Isela, is there, are there more of these videos somewhere that folks can access? Yeah, um, I think we have about maybe between 10 and 15 free videos on our YouTube channel. Um, so if you just visit youtube.com slash Lab, you can see our virtual training. Um, some of the videos are a full class, so maybe they're like 40 minutes long. Some of them are like four minutes long where you're going to have to repeat and teach yourself just depending on your level. There's all levels there too. Um, and then I know that we may be doing some Instagram live, like mini classes in the next week or so, just to keep people engaged. So yeah, stay tuned. We're, we're trying to, uh, if you don't want to come outside and dance, if you want to, you can do that too. Uh, but yeah, visit us on YouTube or at our website, sackdancelive.com, and you'll be able to see how to, um, how to start dancing with us. So in that same vein, what, 
what can people watching do to get involved or help support your groups? Um, Melissa, do you have any input on that from your guys' side? Uh, yeah, I mean, social media helps if, um, you know, we always have our side gigs with teaching too. So um, finding us on Instagram, Facebook, um, how we can share with, with a wider audience. Um, with my own rep, it, it could be, yeah, like teaching yoga or um, uh, teaching modern. Um, I miss my hip hop body for sure. I've been thinking about that. My sister wants me to mi mimic uh, a Billie Eilish uh, millennium dance video to teach her. <laughs> and um, so that that's on my list to do. <laughs> uh, so yeah, um, finding our names. Alexandra Griffith, Melissa V. Cervantes, Lorelai Bain, then all the people that work with her. We all have, we're all artists, right? We find our ways to find work. Sometimes we're not, I'm not one to, to produce content all the time. Isola's great at it. Um, I should learn from her more. Uh, but yeah, just on the lookout. Excellent. Well, I want to be respectful of your guys' time um, and thank you so much for joining me tonight and taking some time out of your day. I seriously can't wait till we can all be together again and watch you all perform and feel that energy we've been talking about um, all night. And for all of you out there, thank you for watching. If you're feeling the need to get moving, go ahead and click on that link i'll put it back up on the screen um to watch that sack dance lab video and get dancing in your living room so thank you again to sack dance lab and the lorelei bain project um especially keep an eye out tomorrow for a video that the lorelei bain project worked very closely with our marketing team to produce. Um, you might remember that you, they were scheduled to perform at our March Art Mix Funk Springs Eternal. Uh, so they've all graciously recorded their parts and we've put them all together so we can watch kind of a digital performance. That video will come out tomorrow and you can find it on the Crocker's YouTube page, Facebook, or on their website. Um, I'll pop our YouTube channel up if you'd like to join us there. Uh, join us next week for a live look and learn on June 2nd at 12 p.m. and another edition of the Rogue Book Club on Thursday, June 4th at 6 p.m. Uh, more information on both of those programs can be found on our website, crockerart.org. Thank you all again so much for Thank hanging you. out with us for Thank, Thank you. Thanks. All right. Thank you. I hope everyone has a safe and maybe a little funky, jazzy night as we <laughs> go watch all that video. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, good night, everyone. Bye. Bye. Nice meeting y'all.